hey, we're going to go ahead and dive in together. Thank you guys so much uh, for joining us. This is a, a nice full session. This is going to be great. So um, as we jump in, let me introduce myself real quick, and then we'll dive into the topic of culture making and disciple making and those things together. So uh, my name is Chris Cummings. Um, I'm the college pastor and discipleship uh, director of discipleship at our church in Galveston, Texas, uh, Coastal Community Church. Been there for about seven years. Um, been doing college ministry that entire time. Uh, we started the, our, the college ministry there. We reach out to the smallest public school in the state of Texas, Texas A&M University at Galveston. Current enrollment. 1,700 students, okay? Insanely small, all right? Um, some of you are like, wow, that is very, very small. We have more students in our ministry than that. Um, but it is, it is quite, quite small. Um, over the course of time, uh, we've seen upwards of 8 to 10% of the student body be a part of our ministry, um, which is really, really cool. Um, we've gotten to a point now where we we're seeing students um, uh, step into leadership, leaders being multiplied on campus, uh, and it's been really cool to see what God has done on a on literally the smallest campus in the state. Um, this is my beautiful wife, Kristen. <clears throat> um, uh, she We've been married for six years now. We have four amazing kids. Their ages are two, three, five, and six, which means that in our house, someone is always crying. It is usually one of us, okay? We are typically the people that are crying in our home. Um, but we love our kids. Um, all of our kids came to us through foster care. Um, none of them are biologically ours. They are all one sibling set. Um, so they are all biologically brothers and sisters. Uh, they've been in our home uh, for almost three years. Next month, we'll celebrate three years of them being in our home. And then this past November, we adopted all four permanently into our care. And so they are officially ours, and they will be ours forever. Um, we uh, are also in the process of planting a church in Tucson, Arizona, uh, to go after the University of Arizona. And so at the end of this year, beginning of next year, we will now uproot our entire family and move to the desert of Arizona and plant a college ministry or a church right in the heart of Tucson going after the University of Arizona and hopefully be a gateway of church planting all across the Southwest region of the United States. Tucson is the 16th most post-Christian city in America. Uh, to put that in perspective, New York City is 20th on Barna's list. Okay. So Tucson's insanely, insanely post-Christian, very unchurched, de-churched, uh, and just very, very broken and very spiritually dry. Um, and so we're hoping that we can plant a healthy church right in the heart of the city, going after the campus, leverage the campus to plant churches all across the Southwest. So it's a little bit about me, about us and our family. Um, this breakout is creating a culture of disciple making. So I'm assuming uh, the reason you're in here is because you want to learn how to create a culture of disciple making, or maybe you uh, are in the process of doing that, or maybe you've already done that and trying to get more tips on how to like help that flourish and all that kind of stuff. And so I'm excited about jumping in this with you guys. Um, this is a big passion of mine. Uh, when we started our college ministry, we started um, really as kind of this attractional style ministry of just, hey, how many students on campus can we get to come fill this auditorium in our worship gathering. That was our entire approach. Uh, and I would say that we made disciples, but we made them accidentally, okay? Uh, it was not intentional disciple making by any means. Uh, we had some people that by the grace and power of God alone uh, grew and mature in their faith. Uh, and we have taken since then some real intentional steps uh, to help make disciples and uh, send students on campus to make disciples and multiply. And I'll say this, uh, the, 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 the best gift that God has given you in your ministry when it comes to reaching your campus are your students, okay? Students have access to the campus like we as leaders do not have access to. I mean, they live there, they go to school there, they study there, they eat there. They have access to dorm rooms, they have access to classrooms, they have access to other facilities that you and I do not have access to, okay? If we want to win the campus for Jesus Christ, our best method is to mobilize students who are in the best possible position to carry the gospel in places on campus that we don't have that access to, okay? And so this breakout is about doing that very thing. How do we take the students in our ministry, 
mobilize them, and send them out to affect the culture of the campus, okay? Now, one thing I want to get clear right off the bat, this breakout is not strategies in disciple-making, okay? There's a huge difference between strategies and culture, okay? Strategies can help create culture, um, but this is more around the idea of culture, creating a culture of mobilization and uh, multiplying uh, disciple-making inside of our ministries, okay? And the reason why we're focusing on culture is because culture is powerful, okay? Culture helps define the horizon of possibilities, okay? How the culture is in certain environments uh, kind of prep what it is that we're able to do or what's really hard to do or what's a lot like easier to do, okay? And so if we're going to understand what it looks like to make a culture of disciple making, we need to first understand what we mean by the idea of culture because oftentimes culture is this thing that we feel and this thing that we experience, but it's a lot harder to to like define, okay? So here's a, here's a quick uh, definition of culture, what culture is. Culture is the underlying beliefs. I wish I had a PowerPoint, by the way. I actually do. I forgot my adapter. So my bad, guys. So I'm going to read this very slowly if you're trying to write notes. Culture is the underlying beliefs, assumptions, values, and ways of interacting that contribute, that contributes to the unique social and psychological environment of an organization. I will read that again. Culture is the underlying beliefs, assumptions, values, and ways of interacting that contributes to the unique social and psychological environment of an organization. Okay. In other words, to put it kind of simply, culture is the heartbeat of an organization. It's that thing that's oftentimes hard to define, but easy to experience. All right. So let's play, let's kind of a quick game. All right. Let's, let's take two organizations that by definition are basically the same, but culturally insanely different to kind of get, so you can see what we're getting at here. Okay. So let's take Walmart and Target, right? By definition, they're basically the same thing, right? Superstores sell a bunch of clothing, halves groceries, one has guns, one doesn't. That's a big difference. But typically, they're essentially kind of the same thing. They're running in the same market. Culturally speaking, very different. Who would much rather go to Target? Okay, if you raise your hand, why would you rather go to Target? It's cleaner, right? The, the wheel on the cart doesn't rotate and squeak, right? Um, other reasons why you might go to Target. Cleaner. There's a Starbucks in it. Hey, wait a minute. There's a Starbucks in it. Yeah, right? Like maybe some of the brands in there are better, right? You got Chip and Joanna, you know, all their stuff in there. You know, uh, yeah, there's that. Who would rather go to Walmart? Be, be bold. A few. Way to go. The few, the proud, the Walmart veterans, right? Why would you rather go to Walmart? We all know the answer already, but go ahead and say it. It's less expensive. It's less expensive. That's the only reason why you go. <laughs> it's cheaper, right? So two, two stores running the same market. Culturally, though, completely different. When you walk into Walmart, you're going to experience something and maybe smell something that's different than when you walk into Target, Right? Take Popeye's and Chick-fil-A, right? The Lord's chicken and chicken from New Orleans, okay? Different cultures, right? Both of these are restaurants, both giving chicken, both in the same market. They would both probably say that they value customer service, but clearly Chick-fil-A probably values it a lot more than Popeye's, right? I mean, they say my pleasure after every little thing. Like, it's pretty incredible, right? Even the culture of campuses, Like there are, if you're a student in the room or if you graduated from a university, there's a reason why you chose the campus you're on and not another one. And sometimes that has to do with majors and sometimes to do with culture. The culture of Texas A&M is a lot different than the culture of the University of Texas. And both of those are a lot different than Texas Tech and a lot different than Baylor, right? These cultures 
are different. Same market, same thing, all universities, very similar majors between all of those. But culturally, they all have different vibes, right? And because their cultures are different, it shapes the horizon of possibilities. It it makes some things really easy to do and some things really, really difficult, right? Like if you wanted to start an agricultural club, A&M is your best bet for it to really work. Other schools, you can probably get it on there too, but like A&M is just, the the culture is so farmer friendly that like it's not going to be hard for it to take root. If you wanted to start a sorority for women who are looking for their husbands, Baylor's a great spot, right? Like, that seems to be most Baylor people, all right? Um, If you're from Baylor, I'm sorry, but that's just the stereotype of your school, okay? So, uh, for example, for us, right, we're the smallest public school in the state of Texas, okay? Texas A&M Galveston, incredibly small. Um, The student body, 70% of the student body at A&M Galveston live on campus, 70 plus percent. So most of you are, are doing work at a school where the rule is after your freshman year, you can move off campus. At Texas A&M Galveston, you have to be 21 years or older to finally move off. Reason why? They built some brand new dorm rooms that they can't afford and they need people to stay a little bit longer. They won't tell you that, but we know they changed that rule as soon as those buildings went up, okay? But that, that, that changes our culture, that changes the horizon of possibilities for us as a ministry. We do a lot of things in ministry that are centered on the campus of AM Galveston because 70 plus percent of the people live there. For us to do off campus events is really, really hard. It doesn't take root as well as some of the other schools that are represented in this room because our culture is like that. Culture affects the horizon of possibilities, okay? Now, the culture on all of our campuses is different and unique. So when you start crafting culture in your ministry, okay, when you start thinking about how are we going to make disciples, which one, you are called to make disciples. We're gonna get to that in a second. You are called to make disciples. You have a unique context in which you're making disciples, okay? The question that you need to be asking already is not only how are we making disciples, but how are we making disciples at Tarleton State, TCU, UTA, Texas Tech, Baylor. How are we making disciples in those environments? Because every single one of those cultures is going to shape how you make disciples on those unique campuses and as you engage those unique cultures. And so one of the, one of the, one of the best things that you can do right off the bat is just to ask the question, what is the culture of the campus we're trying to reach? What is the demographic breakdown? How many students live on campus? How much stuff happens on campus? Where are the hot spots off of campus, right? Texas A&M Galveston is directly affiliated with Texas A&M College Station, which means that we're an extended campus of College Station. We are not a sister school like Corpus Christi A&M or Texarkana. We are a direct extension of main campus, which means that every student at A&M Galveston gets the option to have uh, season tickets for football games. And they get pretty good seats, which means that it has created a culture in Galveston where students are not in Galveston on the weekend. They are driving three hours to go spend in College Station and staying there throughout the entire weekend and then coming back, which means that we don't have a lot of students that show up on Sunday mornings. And we can't really leverage our Sunday morning gatherings to be able to engage college students because they're not even in Galveston. That is a cultural uniqueness to us. My guess is that that's not the same thing with, with, with your culture. We've also found that in our culture, 60 to 70% of all freshmen coming in will transfer to College Station after one year. 60 to 70. We lose some of the best future leaders for our ministry because they go to College Station. If you are a College Station person and you want our people, we will give them to you gladly because they are coming that way anyway. Uh, we've always joked if you're, if you're in College Station and the only place that you're grabbing leaders from are people that are leaving our ministry and coming to College Station, you would have a huge leadership team, <laughs> like bigger than we would ever possibly have. So we've had to change how we structure leadership because Our culture doesn't allow us to retain as many leaders as we would like to retain because a lot of them are transferring to College Station to do what they want to do, okay? And so the first thing 
that I would, I would encourage you to do is ask that simple question. What is the culture of the campus that we are trying to go after? Okay. What, and then, and then because of that, what is the horizon of possibilities and impossibilities or difficulties? Technically, nothing is impossible. But some things on your culture are going to be a lot harder because of the culture of your campus. Okay? There are some things that are going to be super easy. Easy wins. When we do on-campus free lunch, easy win. We will meet, no lie, no lie. On a campus of 1,700 people, we will meet 200 in an afternoon by giving out free barbecue. 70% of the student body lives there. Okay? That's huge for us. Okay? You might not have that same ability on your campus. And that's okay. But ask that question. What is the culture of your campus and how does that affect your ministry strategy to make disciples on that campus? Okay. Now, here's the thing. All of our cultures, all of our campuses have differences that are easy to see and easy to kind of feel and experience. But there is something about each one of them that is the same. Okay. And, and this is what's similar across the board for just about every single campus. And it's this. It is becoming more post-Christian. It is not becoming more Christian. Okay? It is not drifting towards holiness. No one drifts towards holiness. You drift away from it. That's the natural bent. No one drifts towards holiness. Every single campus that's represented in this room is slowly moving more and more and more and more and more away from faith in Jesus Christ. The need to mobilize students on campus has never been greater than right now. And we as the church, as we see this unfolding on, in campuses and in cities and in neighborhoods and all, all of that, we as the church should be committed to raising up leaders and sending them out into those cultures to affect those cultures for the glory and for the name of Jesus Christ, okay? Now, here's what we've traditionally done as a church, okay? Traditionally, what we've done is, hey, there are lost people. Let's get them. How do we do that? Let's have a giant worship gathering and then put a bunch of flyers on campus and try to get them to come in, okay? I think, I think sometimes the church can be guilty of confusing marketing with evangelism. It's a personal conviction of mine. Um, and we need to go back to the root of what it means to make disciples desperately. When we move to Tucson, Arizona, we are not under the impression that if we just have an amazing worship gathering, if we build it, they will come. That we, we don't believe that's going to take root in that city. What we're going to need is we're going to need normal, everyday Christians to carry the gospel in places that we cannot carry it because we don't have access there. We have to mobilize our people. You see, here, here, here's the ironic thing, okay? The, the ironic thing is that when we've talked about trying to reach certain places, we, we keep trying to kind of build and market a church and try to grow this church. But here, here's the reality, in what command did Jesus give? Did he ever tell his disciples, hey, go plant and build churches? You won't find it in the Gospels. It's not there. He doesn't say, hey, go therefore and plant churches. He says, go make disciples. The result of making disciples is the local church. Planting and trying to build and market a bigger church does not always equate to making disciples. Right? Mike Breen, um, who uh, wrote a book called uh, Building a Discipleship Culture, he says, if you make disciples, you will always get the church. But if you make a church, you rarely get disciples. What Jesus has called us into <clears throat> is not to necessarily plant churches. We are going to plant a church in Arizona. And I strongly believe that what's happening is that God is planting a church there and he's invited us to come be a part of it. Jesus, when he talks about churches, he mentions it twice in the Gospels. And one time he says, I am the one who builds my church. Well, the way we assist in building the church is by making disciples. Uh, I heard J.D. Greer say one time, it takes a thousand miracles to plant a church. And my wife is starting a journal, keeping track of all the miracles that we're seeing. Because we strongly believe that Jesus is building a church in Tucson, Arizona. And he's invited us to be a part of that. That's it. He 
builds the church. And so we are called not to build the church. We are, we are, we are called to make disciples, okay? The result of making disciples is always the church. Planting churches does not guarantee you disciples. Getting disciples, making disciples will always get you the church, okay? Now, when we talk about making disciples, I don't think anyone's head in here is like, no, man, I'm, I'm out. Like, I would, I don't want to do this. You are in a breakout called creating a culture of disciple making, okay? If you're not on board making disciples, you are in the wrong breakout. Like, feel free to beat a drum, but this is not like probably the best spot for you at this point, okay? So, but as we talk about making disciples, rarely am I going to see people be like, nope, I'm, I'm out, right? However, Typically, what I have come to learn and know is that when we talk about disciple making, rarely do we have the same idea of what disciple making is in all of our collective minds. Okay, oftentimes you'll never really see a Christian say, "No, I'm, I'm not. I don't want to make disciples. I'm out on that. I don't think we should." Typically, what you find is I don't know how or really what that means. And so, if we're going to build a culture of disciple making, we need to understand what culture is. And we also need to understand what it means to make disciples, all right? And so what I want to do is I want to break down real quick the, the, the famous two verses that Jesus gives us as to what it means to make disciples. And then we're going to talk about what it means to kind of cultivate that culture in our ministries and affect the culture around us on our campuses, okay? So Matthew 28, 19 through 20. And this is what Jesus saying to his disciples, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Something I want you to notice about the Great Commission, okay? This is what that is called, if you didn't know that. Um, in this command, Jesus gives really one single command. There is one main verb that Jesus uses here, Okay? Now, in English, there seems to be a plethora of commands, right? Like, go, make disciples, baptize, teach. All of those things things seems to be commands that Jesus gives us. But the reality is that when you pull back the curtain and you look at it from a Greek context, the Greek author is only using one verb. The other terms are what are called Greek participles. And what a Greek participle does is it helps define the main Verb. In other words, it tells you how the main verb is to be carried out. And the single main verb that Jesus gives in the Great Commission is simply this. Make disciples. That's it. The Great Commission is actually one singular command. Make disciples. Jesus defines what he means by making disciples with the other Greek participles that he uses around it, okay? So the word like go, for example, that word go is a Greek participle, which means that it is better translated to the word going or as you are going, which means that what Jesus is saying is as you make disciples, do it as you go. There's this intentional relationship that he's saying is a part of making disciples, We tell our students all the time when we're training them on on disciple making, we say making disciples is not so much about adding something to your schedule. It's about adding someone to your schedule. That in the everyday stuff of life, we are just making disciples. In those random corners of campus that we don't have access to, but your students have access, access to, we are making disciples in the classroom, in the lunchroom, in the library, on the intramural field, wherever it might be. Make disciples as you go. The entire world is your mission field. The second participle that Jesus gives is the word baptize. So go therefore and make disciples. That's the, that's the verb, make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Baptism is often seen as this first act of obedience for a new believer, right? That we declare our faith publicly through the means of baptism. And so when Jesus says that baptizing is a part of making disciples, what he's saying saying is that disciple making includes evangelism. That there are people who are lost 
that need to be found, people that are dead spiritually, that need to be made alive again, that we need to bring the gospel to people that do not currently believe or follow Jesus. Part of what it means to make disciples is to evangelize the lost, okay? Now, here's the thing. I think in most church contexts in North America, baptism is typically seen as the finish line and not the starting point. Now, we might say the opposite, right? We might say, hey, baptism is not a, not a finish line, it's a starting point. We might actually say that out loud to the people and members in our churches. But I think that the actions of a lot of North American churches show is that we actually believe that, the, that baptism is more of a finished place than a starting point. Um, there was research done um, a few years ago on Southern Baptist churches in America. And in a 20-year time frame, check this out, in a 20-year time frame, SBC churches in America baptized over 7 million people. 7 million. That's insane. Across America, 7 million. It's not just one church. Imagine, that'd be crazy, right? 7 million all across America, SBC churches, okay? To get that in perspective, the entire population of Metro Houston right now, which is the third largest metropolitan area in the country, is just at 7 million people. So basically in 20 years, congrats, we've reached all of Metro Houston. Do you want to guess? Now you would assume, okay, that in that 20-year trajectory that the church would probably grow in weekly attendance and in membership by a factor of around 7 million, right? That would be the guess, right? Maybe 5 million, you know, or so. Like, you know, some people in that 20-year period probably pass away or maybe they shift to different nominations or something like that. Like, but surely at least 5 million, you know, or definitely 2, 1 million at the very minimum, you know? Does anyone want to guess how the church grew in that 20-year period? It shrunk. Like, it got smaller. It didn't grow an inch. And, the, and I think the reason why we see this is because we claim that baptism is not the finish line, it's the starting point, but that data doesn't really show that, does it? Seven million people baptized in a 20-year period, and yet at the same time, the church doesn't grow at all. It shrinks. I think we have a discipleship problem in the church in North America. And when Jesus talks about making disciples in the Great Commission, he says part of it is evangelism. But that's not it. Like, like, like the, last, the last participle that Jesus gives is he says, teach them to obey all that I have commanded you. When he talks about teaching them to obey everything that Christ has commanded, one of the commands that Jesus gives for us to follow and obey is the Great Commission. That's one of the commands, which means that part of discipling believers in the church means teaching them how to evangelize the lost and how to disciple other people towards maturity and towards multiplication. Multiplication is the very heart of Jesus's command as he tells his disciples to turn around and make disciples. We have to not only reach the lost, we have to disciple and equip the saints until they get to a place where they are mature enough and ready to be sent out and to multiply the gospel across the face of the earth. Jesus did not say, hear me, Jesus did not say, go therefore and make converts. He said, go into the world and make disciples. A disciple is not fully made until that person is able to turn around and repeat the process for somebody else. That's the goal we have to get to. So when we talk about creating a disciple-making culture, hear me, disciple-making entails those three things, intentional relationships that as we go in every area of life, we are making disciples, we are modeling the Christian life, we are practicing evangelism and evangelizing the lost and at the same time, we are discipling and we are equipping the saints towards maturity and kingdom multiplication. That's what it means to make disciples in the lens of what Jesus gives us in the Great Commission. Okay, And if we're going to see the cultures of our campuses move towards Christ rather than away from Christ, then we have to raise up laborers on the campus. We have to raise up disciple makers, equip them, 
mobilize them and send them out to campus in places that we could probably never be. Okay? Now, how do we do that? Right? That's really why you came in here. How do we do that? How do we cultivate that kind of culture? To start, okay, first, we need to realize that culture is one of the greatest weapons and things that God has given us to kind of shape our ministries, okay? And really what we're doing is we're trying to affect the culture of the campus through the means of the culture of our ministries, all right? And so how do we do that? Well, the first question we need to ask is what shapes culture? Now, there's, a, there's several things that shape culture, okay? I'm going to give you three. They are, all start with L, so that's really easy for you to remember, okay? And then we're going to unpack what these mean and how we can leverage these in our, in our churches and in our ministries. Culture is shaped by, I think, three main things. Language, leadership, and location. Language, leadership, and locations. Okay? Let's start with uh, language, okay? Language shapes culture. What you say, how you say it, and what you do not say all shapes culture, okay? Your silence is shaping culture, all right? Hear me, your silence is shaping culture. So what you say, what you allow, uh, what you affirm, all those things help shape culture. Your values, what you treasure, the stories that you share, how you define certain words and terms, all shape culture, right? The culture of English-speaking countries is different than the culture of non-English-speaking countries. Even looking in America, the culture of Texas is very different than the culture of New England. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but part of that is, is language, right? What we value, how we speak to each other, all those language shapes culture, and especially how we define certain words and how we use certain words shape culture, okay? Um, our oldest daughter, her name's Maddie. She's six years old. She'll turn seven next month. She's super awesome, really cute. And um, when she was four or five years old, Maddie would use the word yesterday to define literally any point in her past, okay? So um, when, we, when, we, when they came into our care, uh, they came into our care two days before Maddie's fourth birthday. So we got, all the, we got a phone call at 10 a.m. Hey, we got three kids. They come into your house. They came into our house at 5 p.m. that day. And they have yet to leave, okay? Two days later, after that, we threw Maddie, our old, now oldest daughter, a birthday party, okay? And we didn't really know what we were doing because we've been parents for two days. So we bought an inflatable pool and put that in our backyard and a cake. And during that party, Maddie decided to, to as she was like chilling in the, in the little pool, to reach over and bite the inflatable pool and the entire thing deflated. And I look at Kristen and I'm like, who did we just say yes to? You know, like this, like this toothy girl just bit a hole in our inflatable pool. And when Maddie was turning five, we started talking about her birthday party, what she wanted for her birthday party. And she goes, hey, remember yesterday when I bit a hole in the pool? I'm like, yesterday, a year ago, girl, like a long time ago. But in her definition, yesterday meant any time in the past, okay? Now, for me, I use the word yesterday to mean yesterday, you know, like the day before today, probably the same way that you would use it, I would hope, okay? But because that definition was different between the two of us, it created kind of this cultural tension in this, right? Where it's like she's trying to communicate something to me about what happened yesterday, and I'm trying to remember if that was six months ago or if that really was yesterday. What we mean when we say certain words, how we use words, is so incredibly important. The common words that you use in your ministry are shaping your culture, the stories that you celebrate. I heard somebody tell me one time, they said, Chris, you will replicate what you celebrate. And they're absolutely true, okay? What is it in your ministry that you are constantly celebrating? Because that's what you're gonna get, okay? 
What words or phrases are you constantly using? And does everyone in your ministry understand what you mean by those words and phrases? And so one of the things that we did at the very beginning that was super helpful for us in helping kind of craft and create a disciple-making culture is we got our definitions straight. There's a lot of Christian language and lingo that's kind of thrown out there, that Christianese, you know what I'm talking about? And oftentimes we can throw those things out there and not everyone be on the same page, okay? So we can say words like discipleship, evangelism, faith, salvation, a disciple, and all those things might be different things to different people. And so one of the first things we did, we're going to shape culture, is we started defining some of those things. What do we mean when we say discipleship, disciple making, all these kind of things? One thing that was really helpful was just defining what we meant by a biblical disciple. So helpful. Like, how do you know if you've made a biblical disciple if you haven't defined it for yourself? You really don't. Like, you have to define those terms to know if the people you're leading are actually getting to the destination that you are wanting them to get to. Okay? And so, my first encouragement for you is language shapes culture. Okay, how we speak, what we say, what we value, what we don't say, all those things shape culture. And so I would get with like your team and say, what do we mean when we say X, Y, and Z? Because it's going to help shape the culture of your ministry. Okay. And also, how often do we talk about those things? You know, do we ever talk about making disciples with our students? If no, then don't expect for your students to go make disciples, right? That constant language uh, and shared language on your team is going to help craft and create that culture, okay? Second thing that helps create culture, leadership. Leadership creates culture. Another massive difference between New England and Texas, political leadership, right? Leadership affects culture. And the higher up you are in the leadership ranks, the more you like ability you have to affect the culture of the organization as a whole. The volunteer on your team that helps stack chairs is an awesome person, but doesn't affect culture like the person who's on staff. Okay. Leadership affects culture. Which means that as we build out leadership teams and student leadership teams and staff teams and residencies and all this stuff, one, I think, key question that we need to ask ourselves is how does this person in this leadership role affect the overall culture of our ministry? Is it positive? Is it negative? Is it neutral? Because the reality is that every single person is shaping culture to some degree or another. And as you elevate people, as you celebrate people and put them in different levels of leadership, you are giving them keys to the culture of your ministry. You are allowing them to shape and define culture more and more and more. And so let me encourage you, be cautious about how and who you are putting in leadership. We just completely changed our leadership application process. It takes about an hour for students to fill out online their applications now. It used to take like 20 minutes. We have beefed it up intentionally because we want to make sure that we are culturally in alignment. And so we are asking questions about Worldview. We are asking questions about sexuality. We are asking questions about the Trinity and about the gospel and all these things to make sure and to assess that the people that we are putting in this level of leadership are actually going to be people that help create the culture that we are desiring to make. One of the things that's going to kill you more than anything else is when you have people in leadership trying to create two completely different cultures. You are not going to go anywhere. Be careful as to who you put in leadership and the level of leadership. You don't need an hour-long application for your volunteer, right? But when you start talking about group leaders, when you start talking about staff members, you need to like really think through how are we making sure that we assess that these are the right people in these positions that are helping us shape the culture that we want to shape, okay? Leadership changes and affects culture, Okay? If you don't believe me, look at how different presidents have affected cultures. 
throughout all of history, right? Each one shapes it differently, okay? Leadership affects culture. Last thing, location. Location changes culture. It affects culture. My wife and I currently live in Galveston, Texas, okay? That's an island off the coast of Texas. You probably know that. But anyway, it is an island, okay? Island time is a real thing, okay? Everyone is really chill. Everything is really laid back. No lie, when we have our like 9.30 a.m. service on Sunday morning, at 9.30, there's maybe 12 people in the room, okay? By 9.50, there's 300 people in the room, (laughs) It is a laid back, no one's really worried about being on time kind of culture, okay? Now, you take that culture and you, you know, contrast that with Houston, which is a very busy city, very different culture, right? Location affects culture. We're moving to the desert of Arizona, all right? We're about to live in a land with no humidity, and I am pumped, all right? My lips are not ready for it yet, but I am so excited. My hair is going to look amazing. All right. Um, But that culture is totally different. It is shaped by the landscape. Okay. There is cacti everywhere over there. All right. It shapes the culture around you. Location matters. All right. Um, Our church, Coastal Community Church in Galveston, we've been a mobile church doing setup and teardown for 10 years. Okay, a whole decade of setup and teardown. This last like semester, this March, we finally moved into our permanent facility. And that location is changing the culture of our church. We used to be this raggedy old group that would just set up and do the best we could with projectors that had half burnout bulbs in them, you know, every single Sunday morning. And now we have this like really nice, pristine building. That, that alone, it's affecting our culture. For a while, that building felt like a really nice dress. Then it like really fit right. I'm assuming I haven't worn a dress before. Okay, I just want to throw that out there. So I saw some of your faces. You're like, I can't relate. And I, neither can I. But it felt like it didn't quite fit. Like you went to a ball gown or for like, like, like went to a ball, you know, or some like really fancy party wearing jeans and a shirt like this. Okay. It just didn't feel quite right. And it's still not. Like we're still trying to, to kind of make this feel right in this new space because the location is changing the culture, right? Think about this. What's the difference between uh, the cultures of a church that has stained glass in their windows and a church that's meeting in a school gym? Different cultures, right? What about uh, a church where the lights are dimmed and there's this nice light show, you know, you got like a rock concert uh, during uh, worship versus this other one with an acoustic guitar? Location affects culture, okay? And so, and so here, here's my thing, okay? When it comes to making disciples, here's, I think, a really, really good question to ask. Where are you making disciples? Where? Where are you making them? Because location affects culture. If your idea of making disciples is a classroom setting like this, and that's where you make disciples then that's going to affect the culture of what it means to make disciples. Now, I'm not saying classrooms are a bad thing. We we have classes all the time that we offer. They're great. They're really, they can be really helpful. But if all you offer in making disciples is a classroom setting like this, what does that say to the people who are being discipled? It says, oh, to make disciples, I have to create a classroom for myself and teach. Uh, Location affects culture. So the question I have for you, where are you making disciples? And my encouragement for you would be this, to have a balance of something that is organized and something that's organic, okay? Those two things, organized and organic. Let me share with you what I'll do with students and other members of our church. There's always an organized means of discipleship, okay? When I'm discipling them and trying to get them to a place where they can turn around and do the same for others. For example, the guys I'm discipling right now, there are three other guys in our community group, other men, other dads, uh, business owners, stuff like that. I'm not a business owner, but they are. Um, Every single Wednesday at noon, we meet at a place on Seawall called Mr. Taco. 
It is legit. If you're in Galveston and you're looking for a good taco, go to Mr. Taco. You'll pull up and you'll be like, are you sure? Trust me. It is awesome. We meet every single Wednesday at noon at Mr. Taco, Bibles open, talking about what we've read that week, keeping each other, each other accountable for our sins, and talking about what it means to follow Jesus and what it means to lead our kids to faith. Every single Wednesday. That is an organized sense of discipleship. But at the same time, there is this organic side of things. And so uh, when I would disciple college students, for example, we do the same thing. We would meet every Wednesday at Mr. Taco or at somewhere to have this organized approach. But then at the same time, there's this organic side to it. Before we adopted our kids, um, we completely remodeled our home. And the reason we did that was because we wanted to maximize the space in our house to be able to care for as many possible foster kids as, as God would give us. And thank God that we did, because the reality is that we would not have the kids that we have right now in our home. Legally, we could not have them unless we, we did the things that we did. And so I, I am thankful for it. But it took us eight months to remodel our house. Eight months. And one of the things that I would do constantly is I would invite a handful, the same few college guys to come over and help us remodel our home. And what would happen was inevitably we would have gospel conversations in the midst of all that. They would start talking about passages of scripture that they read that they don't fully understand or sins that they're struggling with or a friend of theirs that is lost and that they really want to know Jesus. And we would talk about all these things in the Christian life as, as we were remodeling my house. We'd be tearing out tile in my upstairs and putting down new hardwood floors while they were being discipled, which was great because it meant that I got to disciple people and I got a brand new floor, okay? It is a win-win. And that's what Jesus tells us, right? He says, as you are going, make disciples. Disciple making is not adding something to your calendar. It's someone. Bring them with you as you go. And so that's the big question. Where? Where are you making disciples? And I would say you need a balance of what is organized and what is organic. Another thing to keep in mind, okay? is keeping in mind how people learn, okay? We are discipling people to a place towards maturity and towards kingdom multiplication, okay? So keeping in mind how people learn will help shape the where and even the how that we make disciples, okay? Now, there are three key things as to how people learn, okay? The first one is knowledge and then experience and coaching, The way people learn are in those three realms, knowledge, experience, coaching. We typically put all of our eggs in the knowledge basket. So we create spaces like this, classroom settings, uh, little Bible studies. It's all knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. And that's good. People need knowledge. But they also need experience. They need you to show them what it looks like to actually do the work of making disciples and what it actually means to live out the Christian life. And so when we invite people into our home, they are, my my college students are seeing me discipline and disciple my kids and they are learning from that because they're seeing it modeled and they're going to imitate that someday, which makes me really excited and really scared at the same time because not all the time am I great about discipling my kids and disciplining my kids, okay? And so bring them into that space so where they can see those things modeled. They can get experience together. I remember one time we took a mission trip to um, New Orleans, and we were just walking around this certain area of New Orleans uh, evangelizing to people, and I intentionally took a college student with me. I said, we're doing this together. And I said, I don't want you to do a single thing. I want you to sit there, and I want you to watch, and we're going we're gonna to evangelize together. And then at some point in this whole week, I want you to jump in and help do this with me, Okay. And we talked to a guy named Ernesto for three hours about Jesus. And I would look at my friend, his name was JP. I said, hey, JP, I want you to share your story now. And he's getting experience of what it means to lead people to faith in Jesus and to share the gospel with other people. We have students, and I have a person on my staff right now in college ministry who I am praying to God will be my college pastor in Tucson, Arizona. He was a student as a, with us as a freshman. He started leading as a sophomore. And he has discipled 
uh, he has discipled other students who are now discipling other students. Incredible. Like four generations of disciple making between me, him, the other student, and the student down the road, right? Seeing it happen, getting the experience and being able to turn and do it is huge. And then also that coaching aspect where they're able to do things and then you can give them feedback and coach them along the way to help them improve, so on and so forth. And so if all we're doing is the knowledge piece, we're really missing a lot of stuff, okay? And so where, where are you making disciples? It's crucial when it comes to developing and crafting your culture, all right? So three things as to how culture is shaped and how we can leverage each of those things to help cultivate a culture of disciple making in our ministries. Language, leadership, and location, all right? Now, last thing, and then I'll open it up to some some quick kind of Q&A. This shift towards disciple making, this culture, is hard. It takes time. The freshmen that come into your ministries, okay, are not going to have that culture in them. You are constantly going to have to be moving people into this culture of disciple making. And so here's a, here's a tool that was really helpful for me. My friend Andy introduced it to me, and it has served us insanely well. All right, it's called the Invitation Challenge Matrix. All right, every person who is wanting to make a disciple making culture should know this tool. Okay, and it's really simple. All right, this vertical line. is the invitation axis. What we mean by invitation is we mean this relational equity, right? Investing in someone, but not only investing in them in a sense of equipping and empowering, but investing them in a sense of, I love this person, I'm gonna care for them the best way possible. It's soul care, not just can you get the job done care, okay? So high, so invitation, all right? Inviting, invitation, because we're inviting them into our life, okay? The other axis is the challenge one, okay? Invitation, challenge. Challenge, we are challenging them to actually make disciples, all right? Not just to be really good chair stackers and volunteers. We're actually challenging them to leverage their life for the kingdom of God and make disciples. Every church and ministry falls in one of these four quadrants. We're going to start with the top left, okay? High invitation, high relational, low challenge, is what we would typically call the cozy culture, okay? This is a comfortable culture, right? You have great relationships with people. No one's really pushing you too hard. It's really comfortable. You know, it's like a party. Like, it's like, it's really nice to be here, all right? Cozy culture. Low invitation and low challenge, this quadrant, is what we would call the boring culture. Not a lot happening here. Okay, you don't have any real deep relationship with anybody. There's no real friendships and no one's challenging you to go further. Okay, it's boring. Okay, high challenge, low invitation is what we would call a stressful culture. The reason we call it stressful culture is because you are being you are being challenged to a really high degree. Go make disciples, go make disciples. But they're not there's not this foundation of soul care and love in that relationship, okay? And then this top right one, this is where we want to be, high challenge, high invitation. And we would call this the disciple-making culture, okay? Most churches in America, okay, exist in this culture right here, the cozy culture. Now, we would assume that in order to get people from cozy culture to disciple-making culture, that all we need to do is increase the challenge, right? And we would just go, boop, and we're over there. Here is the reality, and we have, ex- we have experienced it firsthand, okay? It often goes a lot more like this. Dipping down into that stressful culture before being pulled up into the disciple-making culture. And here's the reason why, okay? The main reason is because we underestimate how valuable and important those relationships really are. If you are going to increase the challenge to go make disciples, you need to increase the support, the soul care, the love, the invitation, the relationship that you have with them. It is a lot easier to challenge someone 
heavily when they know that you genuinely care about them. It is a lot easier to do that, okay? And so most of the students that are coming into your ministry as freshmen are going to be coming into this culture, with this culture. They have been in cozy culture. You are constantly going to have to move them to the disciple-making culture, and it is going to take a lot of relational equity to get them there. Continue to challenge, equip them, empower them, develop them, all that stuff, but there has to be this foundation where they know that you genuinely, genuinely, genuinely care about them. Okay, so that means that having that means having some space where you don't do anything, right? Where where maybe you invite them over to dinner and you just hang out, right? And play video games, and you're not even trying to have an intentional gospel conversation with them whatsoever. You are just literally doing life together, all right? And so that's a reality that we have experienced. When we first started to shift this over, we dipped down into here hard, and we have learned the hard way. It takes a lot of invitation, a lot of relationship for people to really get this, okay? So with that, let me close with this last quote, okay? This is from Andy Crouch, who wrote a book called uh, Culture Making. He writes this. It says, the bigger the change we hope for, okay? The bigger the change we hope for, the longer we must be willing to invest, work for, and wait for it. The bigger the change we hope for, the longer we must be willing to invest, work for, and wait for it. Creating and shifting culture takes time, takes energy. It can be brutal. It can be hard. It is insanely worth it. Because again, the best gift that God has given our college ministries are the students in them that we can mobilize into the pockets of campus that we do not have access to. And the best way to mobilize these students is to not only create a really nice, robust strategy, but to craft a culture in our ministries that helps disciple-making flourish, okay? It will take time. It is hard work, but it is certainly, certainly worth it, all right? That is all I have for you guys. Uh, I'll go ahead and open it up to any kind of questions that you uh, might have in regards to either disciple-making, building culture as a whole, any of that kind of stuff. Do some Q&A for a little bit, and then I think we're out at 2.15. Is that right? Okay, cool. So we have about 15 to 20-ish minutes. It's really 15 minutes um, to, to, to Q&A. Yeah. What you're saying is churches are the result of discipleship. Uh, one of the things we're, we're kind of crafting is, you know, we're going to have a ton of freshmen show up at the beginning of the fall, uh, and so we want to we want to propose to them very quickly, like, hey, we want you to find a church in this area. We believe that we are one of the, you know, several good churches in this area, uh, and when you find one, we want you to join it. We want you to become members there. But are you saying more, like, build that discipleship realm first before you push them to membership? I mean, I get yeah. No, I'm really speaking into how churches are typically planted. Like a lot of times when we plant churches, we plant with this like, hey, uh, we build it, they will come kind of mentality. When I think we need to be planting churches in a sense of let's make disciples and then gather them together. But in regards to like churches that are already established and new coming freshmen, I would say, hey, freshmen, we want you to, let's just like you said, get involved in a church, get plugged into a church. But we also want you to learn what it means to make disciples and send you out. Who are working for a church versus students who are going to have, like go seek out and make into a disciple. And so there's going to be some students that it's easy to just plug them straight into a church and make into a church, whereas others, like, there's going to be less and less that are just coming on campus looking for that. So we have a church that is um, a multi generation, and um, a lot of the students have, you know, I used to be with these ministry, so I've seen them from 7 to 12, you know, grow in their faith and then just leave and go out. Mm -hmm. And then we have a, a community college that's right next door that's two minutes away from our church that has not been tapped into at all. Yeah. And um, I guess my question is, how do you find the balance between bringing, discipling the kids that come back on the summer and then go back out, and then trying to create a new culture in this community college to where 
you want to do the supplementing as well. So. Yeah. I'll say first, community colleges is a tough thing to crack. They are hard, okay? Two years is not a long time whatsoever. Uh, in regards to the students that come back, I would say you love, shepherd, and disciple them with the time that you have with them and make sure that you send them back well, okay? Um, but they're not going to be the ones that are crafting your college ministry culture. They're just not around long enough, okay? I would also say this in regards to community college ministry. I think, okay, that the way you go after the college, the community college, is not through the college ministry. I think it's through high school ministry. I think it's reforming high school ministries to make disciples out of high school students and sending them out to college as disciple makers from the start and using those freshmen immediately on the community college campus to go reach students. I think that's the answer to, co to community college, or part of the answer. Well, we have a unique situation to where, you know, a lot of the kids that are, are in the community college are going to work at plants. So it's right. not a chemical area. Yeah, basically. yeah. So they're going to stay in the same location. Yeah. So they're they're not going anywhere. They're just, you know, they're just going to eventually go work at a plant. Right. Stay within the same location. Right. So are you saying that, what, what do you mean by it's hard to crack? So like, um, what's hard with community colleges is getting, to, is like one, meeting students, get, like getting them plugged in, discipling them, leading them to maturity and sending them back out on campus before they graduate in two years. That's what makes it really hard. The, the turnaround is like super quick, you know. In normal university settings, you have four years um, to like help lead people on that trajectory and leverage them. The student is still the best positioned person to make disciples on every campus, whether it's four-year university or community college. Um, and so you as a staff person, you still only have so, so much limited access to the community college. Um, and that's why I would say if there's a way for the high school ministry to really develop those disciple makers, and then they can be your ministry front line on the community college for those two years, once they graduate from that and they're in the, they're in Dow Chemical, then they, then they make disciples at Dow, you know? Um, but, and they're, they're in that young adult sphere. But when they're there, that two year quick turn, like, I think, in order to really mobilize your people from the start, I think I think you almost have to have freshmen that are that, that get it and that you can like say, hey, in your classrooms and in your clubs or whatever, like let's make disciples on campus. Mm -hmm. I've heard rumors that eventually it's going to become a four year program. That'd be great. So that would help a lot because then you, you could have more with them for sure. Um, but yeah, and that's what's hard. Community, another thing that's hard about community colleges is that it's all commuter, you know? Like, there's not like, hey, we're going to hang out on the quad, because there's no quad, you know? Um, when, we would, when we go to A&M Galveston, we can bring our dog and meet half the campus, you know? Because they're all, they're all, they don't live there, and they love dogs, you know? And so it's super easy, or they miss their dog from back home or whatever. Like, that's a real easy thing. If I bring my dog at the community college in Galveston, I'm meeting nobody, because they're going to class, and they're getting in their car, and they're going home, or they're going to work, or they're going to a coffee shop somewhere else to go study. Um, and that's why I th that's what makes it really hard to go after the community college setting. And that's why I think having those freshmen who can lead for you from the start is key. I have a question kind of on that like turnaround. Um, like you mentioned at the beginning, Great Commission, teach us to observe everything I've commanded and, and basically finishes with now go make disciples. Um, how do you view, like, okay, you've made a disciple, you have a culture of disciple making. At what point are you taking this person who recently became a Christian and saying, okay, now you go make disciples? Is there, I guess, could you speak to me as a turnaround there? Yeah. Um, I'll speak to two different turnarounds. Uh, here's one thing. If you know enough to put your faith in Jesus, you know enough to share it with somebody else. Okay? Um, so one, you can start, that person can start making disciples right now through evangelism. I would not have that person disciple other Christians, <laughs> right? So I would, I would say, hey, I want you to turn around, start evangelizing the lost, because that's part of making disciples, but I want you to stick with me for a little bit 
I want to help mature you more and more and more towards Christian maturity to a place where I feel like, okay, now you're ready to disciple that person yourself. Yeah. And then the staff team or the leaders yeah. Are yeah. And then, and then like maybe other people are helping disciple those new converts, whatever. And I would disciple them with that person, you know? And so like, hey, con- like congrats, man. You led someone to faith. That's awesome. Like let's, let's bring them into the fold of what's going on and let's disciple together, get you some of that experience. I can coach you in some, maybe some of the sessions you lead and I'll watch, give you some feedback on that and get them to a place where it's like, all right, hey, I, I am confident. Like, now you grab some people and you start discipling them towards maturity. Yeah. Uh, I've kind of heard, like, the disciple-making relationship described as simultaneously something that you want to do with a lot of people over the course of your life and something that is a very deep relationship that you dive into with somebody and you, you know, do life together, quote-unquote, and you... um, have that like really focused relationship Hmm. so how do you given that you are adding someone to your schedule which is already filled with so many things how do you reconcile the command to go and make multiple disciples with this idea of it's a really like deep and you know focused relationship with one person yeah um a few things on that one jesus did this really well um so i would look for him at him for the answer to this, for sure. So Jesus did a really good job. He called 12 out of the many. That's crucial to know. Jesus did not, the first 12 he met was not the disciples. He had a, a large gathering and then called 12 out of the many, okay? So he hand-selected a few people to be more intentional with, but that doesn't mean that Jesus ignored the crowds, okay? He brought the disciples with him everywhere he went. We have a lot more conversations in the gospel between Jesus and his disciples than with Jesus in the crowds, but Jesus still kind of engaged the crowds. The other thing I would say, so what what that means, I think, is you can have some people that you've kind of prioritized in your life that are in that deep, deep relationship of discipleship, okay? while at the same time still being able to engage kind of the world around you, but not as deep of a relationship, okay? The other thing I would say is this. You are going to reach more people by emphasizing the few for the sake of the many, okay? So at some point, those few people are not, they're not your few people forever, okay? They are your few people for a season. And then at some point, you are going to send them out to turn around and replicate the process with other people. And when that happens, that deep relationship that you have with them begins to shift into a relationship where it's not as deep or regular. So you might, so you might be at a place with them where, hey, every week we're getting really deep into the Bible together, just the three of us. Or every day I'm texting you to check in. But as you send them out and kind of commission them, maybe it's more of like a supervisor approach where like once a month, hey, how's it going? How can I pray for you? Stuff like that. While you take on a few other people for yourself to kind of be in that deeper relationship with them. And so that dynamic will change. You know, you'll, you'll, it'll be, the, and that's what's, you know, Francis Chan wrote a book called Letters to the Church. And one of the things he talks about in that book is he says that when, when disciple making hurts, like multiplication is painful because we get so close with these people that we're discipling that we don't want them to leave, right? But for the sake of the kingdom of God, we have to send them out, right? We have to, to multiply them forward. And so we almost have to like count the cost and, and, and do that. And then, and then we'll grab some more people to disciple deeply, but then they're, they are now re- replicating the process. And through the multiplication of those people, we're reaching the many. Does that help? We had guys like, like, yep, he was head 12, I have 12, and like, he tried, like, he burned himself out for two months. Yeah. Like, even, even in the gospel, Jesus had, like, a narrow circle of, like, three or so guys. Yeah. 12, and he was, like, in very, I mean, the whole, uh, all the 12 didn't see the transfiguration. So, I mean, like, that was, that was purposeful. So, I mean, that, that, that was, like, someone reframed that for me, and that, that really helped. Like, yeah, even Jesus had, like, his capacity for, like, very specific intentional uh, development or his goal, his vision for that was for two or three guys. Yeah, for sure. We tell our students when we multiply them out, find two or three. We don't say go find 12 because one for us, that's a community group. That's a larger kind of community. But yeah, like two or three is a really good 
core people to really kind of focus on a discipleship. It's a good word. If you're part of a church that tends to be cozy, you know, like you want, and they're okay being cozy. Yeah. Right? Budget's still good. Things are going great. They're comfortable being cozy. But, you know, the gospel's calling us to some of their stuff. Like, yeah, so that's that's my reality ish right now. Um, I would say, like, even if they're there and they're they're fine with that, I say you be here. Um, this is what God has called you to do, and like has called everyone in your ministry to do too, right? Um, what we have found is we started shifting towards that, um, and our kind of senior leadership started seeing some of the things that we were doing how it was affecting students, leaders that were being built up in that. And, and I'm, I'm happy to say that there are things that we're doing now church-wide that started in our college ministry. And that was kind of the prep ground for what's happening. Things will also, just FYI for everybody, okay, things will move slower in the rest of the church than it will in college. College is this incubator where things can move super, super fast, okay? And it's going to be easy for you to be like, oh, my senior leadership, they're so slow. I get that. I totally do, Okay. But you also have to realize, like, it, 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 just, it just will. It takes longer. Adults are just, like, they're, they're more in their ways. Uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. It, it really does. It takes longer in the adult ministry world. Uh, college students, you have so much time with them, right? Like, they say they're busy, but let's be real. Are they? Like, you're not busy until you have kids, okay? I'm just saying that now as a parent, okay? But they'll, they'll claim that they are busy left and right. And some of them legitimately are. Most of them are just like, I am tired and I don't want, I need my 12 hours of sleep, you know? Um, and so in college ministry, you, we have a, we have so much time with our college students where we're doing equipping, where we're just having them over to our house, all that stuff. Adults, I'm like, Hey, are you free anytime in 2022? And maybe we can hang out, you know? And so those things take, longer. Um, and so just know that ahead of time, you're going to be breaking ground on things. It's probably going to take a few years for the rest of your church to catch up to. Where would you put uh, like attractional, like the super attractional churches in that kind of realm there? Because we have I'll put them here. Really cozy. Yeah. I mean, we have one that's like a hyper attractional mega church in our town. And we get a lot of people that, that, that come, you know, after like their junior, senior year starting one little more beat. Yeah. It's like they're like an adrenaline junkie. It's like if the you know they're so bored on Sunday because we sing the choir, and you know we're having to say like no that's okay like it's okay to you know we're almost having to like like bring them down from a certain high of like yeah it's not always you know hype a, a rock concert yeah hey sorry we don't have a DJ before the service starts but I mean so I mean, do you put that still as cozy even if it's like a like they're they're kind of high strung in a weird way. I think typically churches that fall, and not, not everyone, so I'm not going to paint with a, a wide brush, but I'm going to say typically what I have seen is that most churches that fall in that category, uh, they, just, they just don't do the challenge part really heavy. And like I think you even said it, like there's no meat to it, right? Like how much can you challenge if you're not putting like meat behind things? What most of them are trying to do is build a relationship with you so that you can stay and stick in their church is typically what I've seen. Like community groups are leveraged so that people will just stay involved in their churches. But there's not a lot of challenge kind of coming out of that. But one thing that you could try is maybe keep the choir, but at a, at a laser show, you know? Like, <laughs> no one's done it before. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That'd be, that would be kind of weird. But, hey, you could be an entrepreneur or a pioneer. Any other uh, kind of final questions before um, we wrap up here? All right, cool. I think there's like a 15-minute-ish break. Okay, before like next. And so if you do want to ask questions, feel free to come up. Let me pray for you real quick, and then we'll head to the third uh, round of breakouts. Lord Jesus, God, we love you so much. And just so thankful for this time with these leaders. And uh, God, I pray for just for each one of us in this room, Lord, that you would continue just to cultivate within us a deep, deep, deep conviction uh, to make disciples and to multiply disciples. God, help us see the culture of our campuses, the culture of our, our ministries, and Lord, help guide us and lead us to a place, God, to where we can have a disciple-making uh, culture uh, that, that is affecting the culture of the cities and of the campuses around us. And so, God, you are so gracious. You are so kind. Uh, we love you, Jesus. And then we pray. Amen.